Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction House, where we are continuing with our look into the history and the development of the Thompson submachine gun. And today we're going to be taking a look at Savage production guns and the 1928A1. So uh, to put ourselves in the proper perspective, it is currently 1928, and uh, there are a couple major changes that are going to be happening here for uh, auto ordnance. One is that General John Thompson retires, uh, steps back from the business, and is no longer involved, and his personal influence had been a major impact on the company. So what he said kind of went. Well with him gone, things start to get a little bit looser. And right about the same time, Thomas Fortune Ryan dies. Now Thomas Ryan had been the financier for auto ordnance right from the beginning. You know, it's not cheap to contract Colt to make you 15,000 very nice guns, and that money largely came from Ryan. Well, they've been having trouble selling these guns, and uh, Ryan owns a big stake in the company. The company's heavily in debt to Ryan. So when he passes away in, I believe, 1929, his estate pretty much immediately wants to liquidate their interest in the company, which means selling the whole company. Now the other investors, the minority investors in, the, in auto ordnance, were able to prevent this for about 10 years. And that's 10 years where they managed to sell about 5,000 more guns. It's, it, it's really selling quite slowly. Uh, this is not a successful business. They've made a military gun and they're trying to sell it in a peacetime market. And it's, they're getting a few. Police are buying some. Individuals are buying a very small number. At any rate. Uh, by 1939 this comes to a head, and the Ryan estate is finally able to force the sale of the company. And the guy who is who arranges to buy the company is a guy by the name of Russell McGuire, and uh, he is not popular with a lot of the minority shareholders. A lot of the shareholders in this company are people who are very much attached to the company. They've been in it from the very beginning, and they think they see the potential in the gun and the quality, and, and they don't want to see the company destroyed. And McGuire has the reputation of being what, what they'd call a corporate raider. Uh, certainly the same sort of person that still exists today. His modus operandi was to find failing companies, buy them up, and then split up the company, and, and write off what debts could be written off, sell whatever assets were available, squeeze all the remaining value out of the company, and then walk away leaving it just an empty husk. And a lot of the shareholders didn't want to see that happen to auto ordinance. And they were in luck. Well, sort of, if you can consider it lucky, uh, because it's 1939 and World War II is starting. And all of a sudden now there's starting to be some significant demand for military submachine guns. And uh, within just a couple months of acquiring the company, McGuire would get a contract with Savage to start remanufacturing, or to restart production, of Thompson's. He actually tried to get Colt to uh, to do this first, but Colt was busy with uh, with other uh, firearms manufacturing work, and they didn't want to take on the project. But as part of the terms of the original manufacturing contract with Colt, uh, Auto Ordnance owned all of the manufacturing tools that had been used that had been developed by Colt for the production. Those at the end of that original production run became property of Auto Ordnance. So when they got Savage to agree to a production contract, they were able to provide Savage with a complete, basically a complete set of production tooling, which allowed Savage to tool up and start making the guns very quickly. And they signed a contract in December of uh, 1940, and, or December of 1939, and by April of 1940 the first guns were actually coming off the line and being delivered. So these first contracts would go, one of them to France for I think 3,750 Thompsons, um, France was of course very desperately trying to put some of its own guns into production uh, before Germany invaded, before the war with Germany really heated up, and so they decided to spend some cash money and buy some available guns from the US. Uh, same thing basically would be true for the British. Uh, Great Britain would order hundreds of thousands of Thompson guns starting uh, in 1940, and so there were some contracts for British product for guns going to Britain. And as this began, the gun that they were producing was basically identical to the 1928 pattern gun that, well, dated all the way back to 1928. It, it had the, the fancy Lyman rear sight, it had a finned barrel, it had that vertical, uh, you know, fancy distinctive looking vertical front grip, had a cuts compensator. Those are the sorts of guns that went to Britain and that went to France and were available for commercial sale early on, like before the US entered the war. Uh, 
But that would change, because as the war heated up, uh, major, made huge US military orders started coming in. And <laughs> Thompson, well, Auto Ordnance and Savage would have to make some compromises to be able to keep up with production. So uh, we have two different patterns here, and there are a couple of different varieties of what came to be designated the 1928A1. We're going to take a look at, at a bunch of those, but I want to point out a couple things first. Uh, Savage would do the bulk of the production of these guns during World War II. However, Auto Ordnance did reinvest some of its profits back into the company, and they actually bought up a, uh, an old abandoned or defunct uh, brake lining factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and they turned it into a production facility of their own. And Auto Ordnance started producing receivers and trigger frames for their own Thompson guns. This was the first time since World War I that Auto Ordnance actually had its own manufacturing facility. And uh, they would produce yeah, about a quarter of the guns uh, made during World War II themselves. Or they'd produce the receivers, they subcontracted out most of the other parts, but then did the assembly themselves. So uh, with these 19, these basically call them World War II production guns, the 28s and 28A1s, you'll find both Savage production guns and Auto Ordnance production guns. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a closer look at these two and go through what changes were made over the course of this production. Let's start with markings, although actually even before that, let's take a look at the finish here, because this is not the same high, high gloss blue finish that Colt put on the 1921 guns. Well, there was actually a change in the standard of finish of the guns when Savage took over production, and they now, instead of being blued, they used a finish called Dulite, um, which when it was applied to a sandblasted surface like uh, these receivers, uh, it came out kind of a flat grey, like you see here. This one's got a little bit of wear on it as well. So these don't have sort of the luster of the pre-war guns, and that makes sense. They're trying to make them in much greater quantity now. So uh, that aside, we have the, the general nomenclature here, Thompson submachine gun. By the way, it is John Thompson himself who coined that name. Uh, submachine gun was a creation of, of auto ordnance and, and John Thompson as a way to describe this new handheld pistol caliber uh, well, submachine gun. It's a term that absolutely took hold, and we still use it to this very day. Uh, which also, by the way, explains why it's not used in some European countries, where they prefer terms that basically translate into machine pistol, uh, when, when translated literally. Anyway, our designation here is, they, they took a model of 1921, they added an A1, and they added a US. That US was actually added in 1941 because of the Lend-Lease Act. Um, all, all guns that were being uh, shipped out for Lend-Lease, uh, you know, sent to other countries, were required to be marked US, and so they added a US to the designation just for all of the Thompsons, because the Lend-Lease guns were taken out of regular um, ordinary production line. Now, we'll also have a serial number here, and you'll see this is number S472230. This is the only way to determine guns that were made by Savage, as opposed to guns that were made in Bridgeport by Auto Ordnance. Uh, Savage was not allowed by the contract uh, to put their full name anywhere on the guns, so all they got was an S prefix serial number. So this particular one is a Savage production gun. As I said, they weren't allowed to put their own name on it. Uh, the, the guns were all marked with Auto Ordnance's name, as you see right here. And there's still some patent information on the back of the receiver. For comparison's sake, here is an Auto Ordnance production gun. Note that it is AO, Auto Ordnance, and serial number 150,000 and change. Um, there are some changes that were made to this, which I believe are the result of uh, police use after the war. Um, the, the C, the, it was 1928A1, overstamped AC, and an X added after the serial number, um, which, I, if I'm not completely incorrect, indicates uh, a, a sale to a police department. Uh, one thing I should point out that I didn't mention earlier in this series, uh, all of the guns are marked uh, A. So 21A, 28A. And the reason for this, they were originally, they thought they were going to do two different standards of the gun. A, a basic level, which would be the A model, and a superior model, which would have been marked S. Just for a fancier finish, fancier wood, that sort of thing. Well, they never ended up producing the fancy versions. They only made the standard guns, and thus they all ended up being A models. Uh, then the C, indicates whether or not the gun was sold with a cuts compensator. So uh, that's why you'll have 21A, 21AC, 28A, 28AC, and then the 28A1 is a military designation instead. 
I should also point out, uh, we're not going to take one of these apart, because the internals are exactly the same as the previous video, as the, the pre-war 1928 pattern guns. Uh, they have the same 600 round per minute rate of fire. If you'd like to see the internals, I would recommend that you go ahead and take a look at the previous video in this sequence. So there will be a link to that at the end of this one. Now the early 28A1s made for the US military largely followed uh, the, the standard 1928 pattern. Um, these early ones had a Lyman rear sight. This is a, a, a pre-war 28 here with a nice blued finish. Um, but the early 28A1s maintained this Lyman sight. What they did was replace the front grip, and we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, about midway through production, they started changing features over to, to make the guns cheaper and simpler and faster and easier to make. One of the big changes they made was adoption of this basically L-bracket style of sight. That was adopted in December of 1941. Um, it has an, a big aperture here for 100 yards, and it has a little tiny, almost unusable notch on the top for 250 yards. And that replaced this sight that was adjustable out to 500. Surprisingly, the cuts compensator actually stayed on the A1 for a remarkable amount of time. In fact, I believe all of the auto ordnance guns maintained it, and Savage kept it on there for a while as well. Um, as for the front grip, uh, this was fairly early on. For, for the US military guns, almost all of them replaced this vertical grip with a much simpler uh, horizontal grip, like you see here. Now the British and French contract guns had the vertical grip, as did early commercials, but almost all the military ones will have that horizontal grip. One of the other changes made early on was to replace this milled uh, ejector plate that goes through into the action. and holds the ejector right there. They replaced that milled one with a simpler pro to produce stamped version of the same thing. So that's three separate parts stamped and riveted together. Um, and that took on, that, that started use uh, with the early US military 28A1s. And lastly, by the, the late segment of production, the barrel fins were removed. Uh, basically, it was it was deemed suitable that the gun was open bolt. Uh, that that gave it enough cooling capacity. The extra cooling that you would get from the fins on the barrel was really unnecessary and and not worth the expense. Uh, so they were deleted, and we ended up with smooth barrels on the guns uh, late in production of the 28A1. You'll note that this particular one also no longer has a cut compensator. In addition, the control levers changed slightly. So on this very nice pre-war gun, you'll notice that the control levers have nice checkering on them to give you a better grip. Well, as production continued, that would go away. And the, the late production 28A1s have these smooth uh, levers instead. One last element you will see on a lot, if not most, 28A1s is this big reinforcing bolt through the stock, which was not there previously. However, this wasn't actually done during production of the guns. This was a military retrofit that was adopted after production had ended. And they went back and added the bolt to most of the 28A1s, but not all of them. And you might have noticed that one of our 28A1 examples had a 30 round magazine in it. Well, that is because uh, one day before Pearl Harbor, on December 6th, 1941, the US military formally adopted the 30 round magazine. Um, this was found to be a good way to obviously increase the magazine capacity. 20 rounds was a little short. Uh, the Army experimented with 30s. They also experimented with uh, coupled 20 round magazines where you had one upright and then one flipped around under side like this. They found that that was more likely to cause problems when you went prone and stuffed your spare magazine in the dirt. And so they ended up adopting a 30 round magazine pattern. This would go on to be the dominant magazine type used during World War II. These 28A1s are still capable of using drum magazines, and they were supplied with them. Um, especially if you look at uh, pictures of the, the British use of the Thompson, you'll see that they often had drums. Uh, but the drums are bulky, they're very heavy, they rattle, uh, and in combat these 30 round stick mags were found to be the best compromise between handling and ammunition capacity. So these guns started out being sold at the same really astronomical prices as the pre-war guns, like $200 a piece. In fact at the beginning of World War II the US Army was paying $202.50 for a gun. Actually more than the commercial retail price because the Army had some specifications for packing and greasing, and that cost a little extra. Or at least Auto Ordnance was able to tack on a little extra to cover it. 
Uh, however, by 1942, when production of the 28A1 ended, the government price had dropped all the way down to $70. Now that's still way more than the cost of the models that would replace the 28A1, and that's of course the primary reason that it was replaced. And we'll get into its replacement in the next iteration of the, the next episode of this series uh, coming up. But uh, to focus, to stay on the A1 for a minute, uh, in total between call it 19, early 1940 and late 1942 over the production span of this gun, just over a million of these were manufactured. So auto ordnance went from taking basically 20 years to sell 15,000 guns to making and selling a million of them over the course of two and a half years. So a complete turnaround in, uh, in the fortunes of the company, because there was a giant war, and that drove a massive amount of demand for a submachine gun that may not have been the best. This is still basically a World War I pattern gun, but it's the gun that was available, that was tooled up and ready to produce, and that, that's worth more than a better design that still has to actually be figured out and put into production. So uh, this would be the first huge batch of uh, Thompson submachine guns manufactured. And it wouldn't be the last, because after this the Army is going to adopt a new pattern that they're going to designate the M1 submachine gun. So as I said, we'll get to that one tomorrow. And uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. If you are interested in getting yourself a registered full auto legal Thompson submachine gun, uh, take a look at the link in the description text below. There, That will take you to ForgottenWeapons.com from whence you can follow links to the catalog pages here at Morphe's for either of these two guns. You can also search their catalog for all of the other Thompson guns that they have in their upcoming fall firearms auction, because they've got a bunch of them. So uh, I think that'll hold us until next time. Thanks for watching.